My name's John Enright, I'm the Vice Director. Um, I'm really excited to introduce our next speaker. David Hertz is an exceptional architect and we are so proud that he is an alumni of SciArc. I first heard of David when I arrived in Los Angeles in 1987, working for these two guys in the front row at Morphosis. Um, and he was running a company called Syndesis. He invented a lightweight concrete that I think the Cape Manolini tables were made out of. Is that right? So, okay. And I heard about this guy. He was a SciArc grad and started his own company. But of course, we know him from his firm, SEA, the Studio of Environmental Architecture, which he uh, started around that same time, um, where he's really made his mark as a leading Southern California architect focused on sustainability and the environment at a really early time. He's going on 40 years with that mission, um, or what he calls restorative architecture. His accolades are many, including Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt National Design Award for Climate Action two years ago, a Distinguished Alumni Award from here in 2008, He's also a fellow at the American Institute of Architects. And not so long ago, uh, he, is, he and his company, SkySource, along with his partner and wife, Laura Doss Hertz, won the Water Abundance X Prize. Wait, this is a $1.5 million prize to develop and make over 2,000 liters of water from air. That was uh, five years ago. Uh, he's also extremely generous with his time. He serves on many boards, including Heal the Bay and Santa Monica's Task Force on the Environment. He's also an educator and has taught studios and lectured at Yale, SciArc, USC, UCLA, and Art Center. On a personal note, he has been a great supporter of SciArc, and we thank him for his time and generosity. As an alum, I believe he represents the values we hold dear at SciArc. He fights for his causes with passion and compassion. He embodies the idea that design thinking can be applied to tough environmental problems and that architects have a moral obligation to directly engage in this dialogue. He's also just an all around awesome dude. One of the kindest, nicest people you could ever meet. So I've said enough, let's hear what David has to say. And please join me in a warm welcome for David Hertz. Back to Sire. Well, it's a pleasure to be here 40 years since I was a student and sitting in your seats, and uh, it's, it's really a, a privilege to come back to, to SciArc. So you might notice I'm limping. I tore my Achilles heel and the tendon the other day. It's somewhat ironic that I'm addressing resilience uh, with a frailty uh, and a vulnerability. Um, it's appropriate that uh, this Achilles shown there on the left, I had to look it up. I mean, we all know the Achilles heel, but the warrior, great warrior, Achilles, was dipped into a river by his mother to give him invincibility and invulnerability. But where she was grasping at the ankle, uh, he was not able to be wetted and therefore was not invincible on the heel. So. I thought that one spot of vulnerability is interesting. It's been said that vulnerability is a birthplace of creativity. So it's fitting I speak to you in this creative community. The relationship also between myth and religion um, and constructs which are the domain of humans and science which is the domain of humans understanding scientific facts and nature are interesting. These disparate elements are also appropriate to the topic of how we often address life on our planet and how our built environment affects climate change. From a science perspective, my tendon tear is a degenerative maladjustment due to inappropriate allocation of stress 
over time and in between stresses, essentially a structural failure due to excessive stress. Whereas anti-fragility would have taken the more reasonable allocation of stresses over time to build muscle mass instead of bringing this to the elastic limit. These stresses would have created a beneficial outcome. Too much stress on a system creates a failure. But you're learning this in structures class that for equilibrium to exist, the summation of opposing forces must equal zero. But let's start at the beginning. I, to get a proper perspective, I, I really think we need to work um, in context and in being site specific. This is the context in which we all work. This pale blue dot, the only known living planet in the entire universe. This Earth was formed 4.6 billion years ago and its life expectancy is unknown. The planet has provided for a remarkably equitable but narrowly defined climate to support human life within a very finite skin. The atmosphere that sustains all life, the lithosphere, which is, includes the soil and the atmosphere, is thinner than that, the shell of an egg, proportionally, and the troposphere is only 7.5 miles thin, or about one millionth of the mass of the planet. This thin blue line controls our climate. I mean, take a seven minute bike ride or seven minutes to drive through our entire atmosphere that sustains life on this planet. Nature has had billions of years for research and development. In nature, waste equal food. There's no species are unemployed. Earth was remarkably stable until man. Now, nature works in circular systems using diversity and ecological variation. Nature is opportunistic and ruthless to survive. We're only now beginning to understand the complex systems that nature uses. Biomimetic design is one of these fascinating fields that are emerging as we learn more about nature. So if you imagine the Earth's history in totality, in one hour, the humans appear just before the hour strikes. Incredibly small uh, time on the planet. However, our human impacts, because of this essentially creation myth that puts humans over nature. So you have a Western philosophical view of, of a platonic view pointing upwards that is saying we have self-anointed ourselves as having dominion over all species versus an Aristotelian view, which would be a view more of indigenous peoples that see themselves as part of a larger ecosystem in harmony with other species and interconnected with the species. As humans, we are a keystone species. That's the species that makes the biggest difference in the ecosystem. We're an apex predator on top of a trophic cascade where we are in ecosystem collapse in every bioregion on the planet currently. Humans have erased over 50% of life on Earth in just the last 200 years, and species are becoming extinct faster than we can identify them. So it's ironic that humans epistemic arrogance on the permanence of its domination instead has created historians and archeologists which document failed civilizations. Of course, we're moving really from the Pleistocene to the Pyrocene and we're in the Pyrocene era now. As a species, we started with tools of taming fire and used those tools more effectively with grave consequences. We've evolved from ice, uh, from the age of ice to the age of fire. An overwhelming majority of scientists agree the planet is being altered by humans. The science is robust and unequivocal. The scientific record shows over the last 200 years an increase in atmospheric CO2, which is unprecedented in the last 800,000 years of the planet. Just since my birth in 1960, we, we were at three billion people. By 2020, we're at 6 billion people, and we're heading toward 10 billion by 2050. Currently, humanity usurps about 30% more of our natural resources than we could replace. So we're about 1.25 planets is required to support life on Earth now. In contrast, there's 5,000 times more solar energy falling on Earth's surface than we use in, an year, in a year. So it's really not an issue of scarcity, 
it's an issue of accessibility and design. And how do we use these resources more efficiently? Because the planet is finite and we're gonna have an increasing population. So essentially the world is becoming smaller and smaller with our population. We're senselessly gobbing up all the resources available to us in denial of the fact that we are creating a collapse of planetary systems. So Kenneth Boulding, the economist, thought it was appropriate, says we need to shift from a cowboy economy to a spaceman economy. Instead of this cowboy mentality which looked at our resources as infinite and we should take them as fast as we can to thinking about it more like a spaceman would since we are on spaceship Earth as Buckminster Fuller called it. If we think about it that way then everything we take make and waste along the journey is going to have an uh, impact. There's a de-equilibrium right now as a result of this critical slowing. When a system is under stress, it could be thrown out of equilibrium. So we're basically squealing from one stable state to another, and we need to consider the connected whole. So climate change is basically a radical, untested experiment, and how we survive, how we keep alive and thrive, in essence, is a design problem of how we can do more with less. Now, Bucky Fuller had unique insights into our species and the critical path we're on, and he innovated in the ways in which we can build and use resources more efficiently, essentially given that the planet is finite. We need to become more adept as designers to do more with less. Now, of course, we have a very anthropocentric view, a man-centered view or human-centered view, and that represents the systematic removal of randomness for convenience acquiescing to a design that disconnects the management of climate solutions from the people who both enable them and perversely are the most affected by the problems remains distressing, inadequate, and unacceptable. This is part of our shared physical world, the, the technosphere, that's fungible in a way that society would design systems and orient itself to intentionally deliver them to anybody and everybody. In a sense, one could say capitalism is creative destruction. Capitalism and climate change are, of course, inextricably linked. Our entire system is a design construct planned based on planned and perceived obsolescence. Our models of growth without considerations of nat natural capital are future generations. So it's all based on a growth model. Now, of course, we all... Uh, fall for it because the whole system is based on it and they're very skilled practitioners for us to really our entire financial and economic system is based upon growth to fuel consumerism. Essentially it's a tragedy of modernity. There are opportunities to rethink these models, models of the way in which we design professionals can remake and rethink the world. We need to be more conscious of what we take, make, and waste and our lineal models of production and use into more circular systems. Of course, a circular economy is a model of production and consumerism, or, I'm sorry, and consumption, which involves sharing, reusing, repairing, refurbishing, and recycling existing materials as long as possible, rather than extracting new materials. So like biological nutrients in nature, our waste could also be used as technical nutrients in a regenerative, continuous system. As it is for systems, it is for people. To survive in the future, humanity will need to adopt principles of circularity and systems thinking to develop materials and processes that are more organic and nature-based rather than synthetic. It helps to use systems thinking, I think, to rather than thinking in disparate parts. Systems thinking is a way of making sense of the complexity of the world by looking at it in terms of holes and relationships rather than splitting it down to disparate parts, enabling systems change. Now, of course, buildings represent over 40% of global energy-related CO2. Now, I think in our lifetime, we've identified that that the planet is sick, and that's the first thing to identify the illness, and now to come up with solutions. And certainly green buildings have been less bad, 
by things like LEED and so forth, but we need to actually do more than reduce. We need to actually move towards restoration. These, these reductions are, are certainly helpful, and they've, we've made great, stri stri uh, great strides in the creation of green buildings, but ultimately, our buildings should give back more than they take. And I think that's a reasonable assumption that our technology can do that. So of course we've had compounding events and these magnify the intensity of climate change worldwide. Every year we hear, you know, we're, we're breaking another hundred year flood. Every year historic fires, unprecedented droughts, and they've had a cumulative impact and effects that are exponential and the repercussions. We need to act now as CO2 levels continue to rise. So 1.5 Celsius was the Paris Accord number. Now these are happening at a much faster pace than all scientists agree that that is an inflection point in which it's gonna be much more challenging to reverse climate change. And we're heading at this point faster and faster, possibly within the time you even finish your degrees. So the question really is, are we gonna be a self-terminating civilization? I mean, there's been six total extinctions already on the planet. The dependency, of course, water and food and energy are very clear. So I think you know, we, we have an opportunity at this point and it's, it's a critical time. Never has the world been more vulnerable uh, to our species. The resilience imperative, the ecological imperative, so the 21st century demand nothing less than an overhaul of our entire infrastructural systems and the way in which we design the future in an age of unforeseeable disruption. And so this is where you come in. Um, I'm gonna speak more about this later, but I wanted to season the terms early in the presentation so you can marinate them. Fragile systems are damaged by disorder. Resilient systems are unaffected by disorder and anti-fragile systems benefit from disorder. So the anti-fragility of the whole often depends on the fragility of the parts of a system. So these terms, resilient, restorative, and regenerative, are, are really, um, are, I think are such important terms, they're pathways. Indigenous cultures are the progenitors of regenerative future. Regeneration, means stitching together the broken strands that separate us from life and one another. That's a quote from Paul Hawken, who is an amazing author and visionary. So by way of background and in discussing resilience, we are all inherently fragile when we enter this world. I heard a quote, we were born you know, in the round, let us not die square. But we're all born completely fragile. And when we enter this world and we have appropriate stressors, we become more and more resilient, whether it's bacteria, or impact, and we appropriately benefit from disorder such that we learn from the principles of anti-fragility. I found these photographs recently and found it interesting in a way that my mother actually typed on the bottom uh, that my fascination with concrete at one years old, but even more interesting is that she used my full name which I think speaks to our family's desire to, um, to seek external acknowledgement. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the closer I looked at the top, it might be hard to read, um, and I just saw this the other day, it's, there's a quote, I'm in front of a memorial, and it says, this is the builder's dream, this is his creed, signed the builder. And of course, with Google today, I found that this was from a 1917 Forest Lawn Memorial by Dr. Hubert Eaton, the creator of Forest Lawn. So I certainly owe my parents so much for my formative years, my mother an artist, my father a surgeon, and in many ways architecture is a balance between art and science. Um, my parents in many ways also provided me a resilience training um, and proved that I could benefit from disorder. Uh, of course, I have a predilection towards defiance which led me to being kicked out of the house at 15 and a half. And I think in retrospect, it was a beneficial stress that got me out in the world and made me more resilient to it. 
uh, in these photos here in the upper left with my father, he built Paramount Ranch with my grandfather. Paramount Ranch is a Western movie town um, that was lost in the Woolsey Fire um, and is now being rebuilt as part of the National Park Service. It's, it's part of the National Historic Registry of Places. So my father learned to build, and some of my earliest memories were being on the garage floor looking up at him at the workbench. Um, I had the tools young to, to build. I even dressed the part. I took risk. I'm, of course, the one laying on the ground being jumped over, uh, which is maybe risk, but not smart. Uh, but I'm here with the tools of building and um, growing up surfing, appreciating nature. At some point, I had to really rationalize my place in the world as someone who would become part of the built environment, but committed myself to work to lessen the impacts of the built environment on the natural. This is a, the essential ethos of much of my work as I aspire to ultimately make a building to give back. My brother Brad, uh, shown there, and uh, with my father fixing up houses in Venice when we were young, um, working with contractors in the field and collaborators, um, helping build uh, my own house with our with my two sons who are here tonight, um, and I'm, he may be embarrassed by this, but a plug to Max, who's a sculptor who graduated from RISD. Uh, and here in LA while applying for grad school, uh, does some very, very interesting uh, sculpture and architecturally inspired work. I think he does not have a predilection towards architecture because he sat in too many public meetings on projects in Venice, and I think it would scare anyone at a young age from wanting to be an architect in that way. But. SciArc is so formative for me, and it's such an honor to, to be here again 40 years uh, after graduating. I snuck out of high school classes at 17 and 18 to sit in uh, SciArc classes in Santa Monica. Uh, I came for an interview with Bill Simonian, who's here tonight, and thank you so much, Bill, for coming, and thanks for letting a young kid uh, enter SciArc. It, it was tremendous. Uh, mentorship that Ray and Shelley and all these teachers have had and left an indelible impression on my formative years. I was also at SciArc during the oil embargo and the energy crisis, and it made me acutely aware of our dependence on foreign oil. And the faculty was very interested in addressing social and environmental challenges uh, in school. Now, I had an early interest in Frank Lloyd Wright and the principles of organic architecture and uniquely American architecture. And that philosophy was certainly ingrained in the work of, of Ray Cappy, who is a huge mentor, and Finn, uh, his son and collaborator, a, a huge uh, in, in, inspiration. We studied for our exams together and remain close friends. So Gil and Joanne Siegel, who I think are here now through massive traffic, and thank you all for coming here. Uh, it was an exercise in resilience just to get through, through the freeways of LA. Um, but Gil and Joanne, Joanne shown there with Mr. Lautner in her, the Siegel residence, which was really an incredible uh, house on the beach in Malibu, shown also in this lower left-hand photo, um, collaborated very much with uh, John Lautner more than most clients, um, and certainly more than John Lautner would let most clients. And they introduced me to John Lautner um, in my first year at SciArc. And, you know, when I sat down uh, with, with John Lautner, he thought it was, I was maybe a little too late to intern with him because I had already been at architecture school for one year and was probably ruined. <laughs> so. so. He was not an academic architect, um, perhaps felt that academia was too constipated for his way of architecture, which was iconoclastic, visionary, and organically based. He used to basically say, you either you get it or you don't. His architecture was like jazz. You, know, you either appreciate it, it's, improv it's improvisational. So he would probably feel like, you know, for him, an education would be like lecturing birds how to fly. 
But in the spirit of generations, the house, one of Lautner's seminal works, the Arango residence, is quite, quite an incredible uh, manifestation of his work. And I've worked for um, this family for multiple generations, uh, for a grandfather, a, a daughter, a son, and now a great-grandson, uh, Evan, who's here tonight, and we're working on a regenerative farm in Ojai. Uh, so it's, it is with humility that, I, um, that I've had the opportunity to work um, with, with multiple generations. Now, in Venice, this was also a formative part of my work. And of course, in Michael Webb book, Michael's here, he's on his 30th book. This was an early book. Michael was very uh, early and following my career and immensely uh, appreciative of his support. Um, but he really wrote the definitive book on Venice architecture. Um, and there's the kind of gritty vernacular. And of course, he had all the morphosis, morphosis buildings going up in the 80s, the, you know, the, the Eames and so many other uh, architects. I won a scholarship at SciArc in my senior year to work for Frank Gehry and worked in the Venice studio. Um, this group known as the Confederacy of Heretics uh, uh, on the beach there is Fred Fisher, Robert Mangurian, Eric Moss, Coy Howard, Craig Hodges, Tom Main, and of course Michael Rotundi, who's here tonight also, um, were incredibly inspirational. These are some of the projects that I worked on at Frank's office in um, consistently different projects, a big push for the 84 Olympics for the Aerospace Museum, but also breaking up color core for mica and Frank's fascination with fish scales and snakes and, and, uh, and other forms were very interesting, and as well as his furniture work. I also had the opportunity while living and working in Venice to work for different artists. So uh, the Larry Gagosian's gallery, designed by Craig Hodges and Robert Mangurian, shown, shown in this upper left, um, was, um, was home to my, uh, Michel Basquiat. And I, my job was to build stretchers for Basquiat and work with him for a summer. And it was uh, quite an amazing experience. But I also worked with Chuck Arnoldi, Dwayne Valentine, Robert Graham, and um, Full circle, I, I later purchased the building, the brick building right next to um, to the Gagosian Gallery as our uh, architecture firm. So this is a 40-year survey. I mean, in 1983, when we graduated, the joke was, what do you call an architect? Um, and it was waiter, you know, because that was the only uh, career path to make any kind of money. There, nobody was building because uh, the economy was in a recession. So the only opportunities other than waiting tables was to be too inventive and performative on a, a small scale. Um, so these icons represent the different uh, paths that I pursued in having a diverse practice. Of course, we know that one of the principles of resilience is diversity and redundancy. And so I began to design furniture um, because it offered an immediacy and an opportunity to, as like little mini architectural projects. They still had a budget, they had a client, they had to stand up. But the, the ability to draw something and then to go make it uh, was, was very, very rewarding and offered me some stability in understanding the way that we, we make things. Now, in this exhibit of my work from the USC School of Architecture in the 90s, essentially like a timeline of these multiple things happening between architecture and furniture and materials development. Um, in 1985, in this upper left-hand photo, I uh, took over the Schindler House and um, did a solo show of my concrete furniture. I did drawings on concrete slabs that were counterbalanced by core samples um, so that they didn't touch the walls of the tilt-up concrete house. Um, and I continued to work with material, uh, principally concrete, from experiences I had at Lautner's and experience I had in construction. 
But ultimately, um, I felt limited with the weight of concrete and the fragility of concrete, and so I quite empirically invented a advanced cement-based composite of half the weight of concrete, twice the compressive strength, and started to play with colors. But quite accidentally, I got a chip of a plastic wheelbarrow in one of the concrete slabs that we would grind down, and, um, and that became an opportunity for exploration into, well, what could we find that is the off-fall on the floors of the factories that were all around me? Brass screw shavings, broken glass, disused records, electronic components, and I began to use that in the syndicate, which was reinforced with post-consumer carpet fiber and um, was made primarily of fly ash. Um, I got to work, of course, with with Morphosis on, on several projects. I mean, some of my fondest memories are sitting with Michael Rotundi and, and watching him sketch and just ideating and then fabricating some fixtures. Uh, this is a stair that I did uh, with Larry Scarpa and Gwen Pugh, all prefabricated pieces. But ultimately, I began to feel the, the weight of my footprint in manufacturing. And it was a somewhat of a reluctant product. I really started just making things because I was looking for material that didn't exist in the market and then got driven by the market into um, a, a larger kind of entity that I felt was feeling run by. So I sold that technology in 2006 and, um, and said, I'm going to use the proceeds from that sale to continue to practice architecture till that money's all gone. That's what it takes um, to practice. And so I started to focus primarily on um, how do I limit my footprint? How do we create um, work, this sea change or alteration or transformation? The work, again, became small scale. Um, and the scales flexed. So there's a little tiny trophy that you'll see uh, that we designed for the World Surfing League, and this is a launch control facility th for SpaceX. So the scale of work can vary, but the general tenets of work is um, indoor and outdoor spaces, uh, blurring the definition between the indoor and outdoor to experience nature in a building, or when possible, to bring nature into the building um, in, in either on a vegetative wall or a roof. So I'm going to go through a couple projects um, just quickly because there's uh, a lot of them and not a lot of time. But this is the first project I did in school, and I collaborated on this project with Michael Rendler, uh, who's here tonight. Um, and Michael and I were driving after uh, school on Fridays out to the desert outside of Reno, Nevada, to help build this house. It was a 55-acre site, passive solar, 100% off the grid until last year, the client uh, occupied it uh, and then passed away there. Um, this is an example of a, a early project. It was about 21. And the reason we show it from far away is because the contractor completely messed it up and it, the detailing was appalling. Um, but that's one of the lessons you learn. The second project, I also collaborated with Mike Rendler again uh, this artist studio uh, and residence in Venice, and it was somewhat unique at the time because people weren't really using unfinished stucco, concrete, rusted steel, and block, and it was a somewhat of a fortress that then opened up inside. Another project um, in Bel Air used a large gestural form to to uh, make a house uh, out of reclaimed lumber and um, sustainable systems, including a solar chimney. Oops, it's going backwards. A lot, of, a lot of the work will also think about in section and think about the principles of natural airflow and ventilation, uh, the use of a courtyard, the use of a bridge. So in this house, uh, which is called the Californication House, uh, I designed and built for my family and it was used as a principal residence in Californication. The other 
project that was in there was one of um, uh, Ray Cappy's houses. So it popularized uh, contemporary architecture in a way. It was about, uh, I built it over two phases um, when land in Venice was inexpensive and, um, and built every aspect of it um, uh, within our shop, furniture, uh, fixtures, cabinetry, uh, syndicate, but it was about trying to create it somewhat of an oasis within a small urban environment. Um, and you could see elements certainly of, of Schindler and, and, and Cappy in terms of the use of reclaimed timbers. Um, it also incorporated bridges, courtyards, natural ventilation, um, rammed earth, solar hydronic heating, natural ventilation, and um, even living roofs. A lot of times the projects in Venice, this is a 32 by 80 foot lot, uh, they are so small uh, that it's gonna be a box. And how do you decorate the box? So this is a project that was more tectonically inspired. And because I had had so much experience with concrete slabs and pouring concrete slabs, um, I wanted to experiment with a house that was made out of prefabricated concrete slabs. So 15 slabs came on trucks. They were cast off site only days before, trucked up when the neighbors went to work. When they came back, all the walls were standing. Uh, it was one day, uh, all the slabs were interlocked together. And so these slabs could cantilever vertically. They um, were very, very durable, and uh, they're made out of a titanium dioxide self-cleaning concrete that exfoliates as uh, over time as it gets dirty. Another box, let's take it as a solid mass and then make reductive gestures to carve away at it um, such that it essentially becomes floating. Uh, it's connected between a bridge or breezeway uh, around a large pepper tree and we're now, we've just finished a renovation for uh, clients that have restored it back to its original condition and bought it as essentially vintage and wanted it back. But the idea was to have continuity of materials from outside to in, so the very polished steel troweled stucco ceiling comes out. So again, it has a cast monolithic feel. In uh, a house uh, in a rural site in Oregon, on the Oregon coast, in a temperate rainforest, I designed a house out of um, concrete that we made um, on site using different variegated river rock, um, bonderized sheet metal, wood, all these materials to withstand 120 mile an hour horizontal wind driven rain off the Pacific, but also that integrated uh, into the landscape and inspired much by Japanese uh, courtyard houses. To, the water flowing down the hill actually accumulates and then continues underneath the entire house uh, undisturbed. A very, another, uh, in this case, Venice oceanfront walk property, a very long and narrow property. The, the goal was to uh, open the house even from the back all the way to the view and to really experience the ocean. And so this window that you see here on the right is uh, on a custom screw jack. So screw jacks can lift and, and um, lower the window and then inflatable seals are used to seal it against uh, the wind driven sand. So here you can see the window comes down to a railing and um, sometimes I've been riding by the, um, on the Venice boardwalk seeing my client who has the biggest suntan of anybody I've ever seen because he sits in his living room and in the sun throwing footballs through the front window to passer buyers on the, on the boardwalk. But the house was made out of a, a refrigeration panel system of insulated stress skin panel skinned in aluminum. Uh, all of these panels came on a truck. Uh, the structure itself was uh, post-tension concrete and steel and then no, the walls have no bearing capacity. Um, so they went up very quickly. Uh, they're coated with a Kynar marine finish and uh, still holding up quite well. Uh, 
So you see a pattern between these Venice houses, these, the, the idea of pulling them apart to make a courtyard and to play with different derivations, in this case, splitting it down the middle to create essentially a continuous skylight and vertical window, playing with uh, cementitious uh, panels, and then c covering the courtyard to the adjacent street, but taking away the pieces such that there were views from the breezeway that connects them and the, court, the water court uh, below. A house that uh, is in addition to a Gerald Lomax house. Jerry Lomax worked with Gregory Ain. It was a very orthogonal, modern house. And so to honor uh, that work, I wanted to make a distinctly different uh, addition that sits on top of it. And so I used more curvilinear floating roof forms and pushed the building out with frameless glass such that the client in that bedroom was really connected to nature. And I feel from all my early work in the syndicate days, building bathtubs and showers out of concrete to bring them inside and outside was to have something primal about bathing that connects you back to nature and the natural world. In, in this house in Santa Monica Canyon, it is completely based upon uh, existing stand of sycamores and how we could have the sycamore uh, to feel like you're living within a grove of sycamores made out of um, uh, FSC certified and reclaimed hardwood, uh, designed the front door. And um, this house was also, uh, this house was built by Epic Construction. Uh, the panel house was built by uh, Ron Senso. Um, and I've worked with these craftsmen builders uh, off and on for different projects. Here's a sink that we designed out of the wood, a folded ceiling plane and millwork as well. In um, 2007, after I sold my Syndicate company, um, I uh, bought a uh, little uh, abandoned uh, Mexican restaurant and market um, it, right on the corner of 20th Olympic and unified that for our office. It was the highest rated lead platinum building in the country at the time. Became a, a laboratory for me to experiment with passive ventilation, with active daylighting systems um, and solar generation, as well um, to to work with green, the green roof. We created a green roof research station that became the, the formative research for the California Science Center building uh, in, in San Francisco. So played a lot with how do you shade green roofs using solar, cool the solar panel to increase the efficiency, use reclaimed water to wash the panels down that then waters the, the green roof. Uh, a Buff and Hensman case study house restoration down to the foundation and in addition uh, a, a project uh, for the Thatcher School, private school in Ojai. I did in collaboration with Yato Suzuki, who, who I think is also here tonight. We've been collaborating together for about 20 years as well. Uh, this, ha this property uh, had about 32 dorm dormitory rooms, uh, commons, uh, faculty housing. It was made out of reclaimed timbers and stress skin panels. So the whole building was prefabricated in that the doors, the windows, the roof, the walls, uh, and, and it was also solar radiant heated, uh, which it's still um, one of the more comfortable uh, dormitories, I'm told, uh, back from the days when um, Howard Hughes was a student there. Um, in this project, uh, there was a very typical tilt-up concrete building. My um, aunt and uncle, I believe my Merle, Aunt Merle made it through traffic perhaps uh, on her way tonight. Uh, she's still racing and showing cars around the world, but uh, has a collection of, of French race cars that um, is really preserving this art of motion. Um, I use the inspiration uh, by using reclaimed windshields to form a canopy um, and reoriented the building on its axis and then opened it vertically um, with stairs use, utilizing solar on the roof and a green roof for entertaining. So like our planet, 
islands make you very aware of the finite boundaries. And this was a project in the Marshall Islands, uh, very, very remote and intact. It's in fact one of the most pristine ecological regions because it was one of the most polluted ecological regions uh, for nuclear tests by Bikini Atoll. Some of these regions on Earth that have been, that have, uh, been left alone, uh, nature has come back. 40 acre atoll, how do you build a building when there's no resources there? Prefabricated aluminum pieces and tensile membranes that capture 100% of the water um, and employ 100% of the waste in an ecological system and generate its power from the biological materials that are available on the island. Uh, coconuts gasified to make heat, to then uh, run pneumatic um, turbines uh, to power the buildings. But I've been very interested in radical reuse and repurposing, and this was for a marine mammal rescue facility at the base of Dockweiler Beach. I was interested in the thousands of battleships that are desiccating and exfoliating their lead and toxins into Santa Monica, into the San Francisco Bay. They're chained together. Um, and in researching what to do with some of, the, uh, of these ships, I found in a floating barge that was used for the Glomar Explorer, a stealth ship called the Sea Shadow. And the idea, this was being sold for salvage. And so uh, my concept was to purchase that ship, bring it down to the beach, crane it in place, uh, elevate it uh, um, such that it would work as a marine animal facility at the bottom and offices at night uh, of above. And then uh, you have the stealth-like form against the horizon. And I was inspired by um, thermal regulation that marine mammals uh, use to regulate their temperature. They use their dorsal fins or their fin to uh, either get heat or discharge heat. And so that, that became this, this uh, rudder that was a movable rudder that would in part self-regulate. Go quickly through a couple of these other houses, the house in uh, South Bay. Uh, we craned a stainless steel swimming pool into the uh, third floor and opened that um, uh, up to the bottom to try to still make a very tight urban house, somewhat open. Uh, another uh, house in Venice that becomes somewhat of a gateway is the first house in Venice on Pacific and Navy. The idea was to create uh, a series of fins, a very solid wall on this very loud street. Almost like fish scales or shark scales, they would be seen one way as monolithic and the other as variegated and allowing light through. Um, in this case, we had enough room because we built a subterranean garage and uh, then poured the slabs on that garage and tilted them up and then built a house which was far less solid and open uh, to a courtyard uh, as it extended inside. So now it's, it's clad in bamboo and one doesn't even know they're on that busy intersection. I had some interesting opportunities working with the 11 time world champion surfer Kelly Slater. Uh, he uh, bought a patent for an endless wave in a circle. And so I did some visualizations on what that could be. And then for another company having this unique experience in man-made wave, built um, a test pool for one in Florida and the idea was similar prefab structures that would support it, but also to use the wave energy uh, for harnessing the power, uh, to use solar energy to cool surfaces and heat other surfaces. And so I began very interested in the systems around that. And last year, um, I got to surf this man-made wave in um, the middle of the California desert. Um, so that was quite, quite interesting to have man utilizing technology to recreate 
uh, nature in some ways, but not as an alternative, but not in place of nature as a augmented nature. A lot of my work I tried to make overt expressions of mechanical systems uh, or to try to still make uh, spaces that open up to the outdoors or into, in, uh, interior. So the process of radical reuse and repurposing, we talked about a little bit, upcycling is instead of something that's downcycled. Uh, in this case, uh, a property in Malibu, um, my client, uh, Francie Rewald, here tonight, and um, uh, to her credit, allowed me to generate a concept about floating wings. The, the initial idea was to just have these Lautner-esque wings, um, and then I thought, why not just use wings, real wings? The idea that, that um, this cross-section reminded me of the laminar flow shapes. I mean, a, a 747 is timeless, especially if you compare it to anything else of its era, because it's shaped by the laws of thermodynamics and efficiency. It's an incredible structure. Norman Foster really refers to the 747 as a building. But when you think about the billions of dollars of research and engineering going in to make something that is the most efficient, lightweight, and strong, it's a shame to have it downcycled into a beer can uh, when it could be reused as a building. So there are thousands of these airplanes desiccating in the deserts of obsolescence in California. I remember seeing them, perhaps you've seen them as you drive on the 395 or out of Mojave. Um, so I convinced my client to buy a 747. Um, and to her credit, uh, she did. She said, let's go look at it. And we went out and looked at it. We um, Then I will show you, because it's easier to kind of describe this, and we, we clipped together some video footage and sped it up. Uh, so it's a little slapsticky, but it goes faster that way. But it does show the process of, of uh, making these, this building. The idea basically is that these wings are like tabletops. This tower air was the uh, 1977, 747-200. It was set for demolition. We cut it in half lengthwise and then lifted those fuselage sections off. We actually just drilling the piles on Friday for the fuselage building on the property. Uh, we then took the wings, uh, rigged them for transport, closed five freeways, um, took that to the Camarillo Airport and uh, in which we cut them in half, closed the runway, and then used the Sikorsky Sky Crane helicopter to uh, bring them to the remote site. Now, one would say, how is that environmental? It, it's, you know, it, it's a huge burst of carbon in a two-hour time frame. So it's a large, less strategy large inputs in less time. This site's very remote. If we were gonna make this in a conventional building, we would have thousands and thousands of trips of lots of disparate pieces that would come, none of which would fit, 30% of which would end up as construction and demolition waste. And so this idea that we are repurposing rather than re usurping primary raw materials from the planet, especially when it comes to aluminum. It's one of the highest embodied energy uh, with the largest, um, largest um, life cycle cost. So the finished project, um, I'll go back quickly, but that is also perhaps best seen with video because uh, like Lautner would say, I mean, it's hard to photograph good architecture because it's a dynamic experience and the interplay between the f roof forms is part of what makes it so interesting. The, root, the, the wing starts at eight foot thick as it hits the root of the plane and goes down to uh, an inch in thinness. Uh, it's an incredibly graceful and strong monocoque structure. And we employed it so that there was an interplay between the wings. There's the lower guest wing, the main, wing and then the primary bedroom is made from the horizontal tail stabilizers. Uh, we reached up and grabbed them at the engine mounts at the strong part of the wing 
and express that hardware and express the finishes, the rivets, the polishing of certain surfaces, the painting of others, the leaving of other portions of the wing, um, the engine cowling as a fountain um, with a fire element to form a courtyard that, and the wings making a forced perspective towards the horizon, towards uh, the Channel Islands and the sunset. Because the property is on a ridge, uh, it integrates very nicely into the ridge, but also gives you the feeling that you are flying because you're looking out over the wing as you would as a passenger. Um, so it speaks to uh, recycling, re radical reuse, but as a progenitor of form, not, oh, we'll put a solar panel on it, but really, how could that become the basis of design? Um, so another project, uh, unbuilt, uh, I was shortlisted for an art center in Santa Monica, Bergamont Art Center. Uh, it was to include a hotel, a new museum, parking, and uh, artist housing. I collaborated with Michael Maltzen, uh, who did this uh, beautiful floating design for the Santa Monica Museum to uh, address the uh, metro rail. So it's a, essentially a metro rail stop where art is just viewed right from your seat in the metro rail and then of course encourages you to get off. Here are the trophies for the World Surfing League. They're made at, they're a 40 year commemorative, uh, commemorative trophy uh, that every pro surfer uh, in the last 40 years was memorialized. I asked each of those surfers to collect sand from their beach. Um, I then poured this that sand and those grains into cast pewter so that the DNA of the history of these world surfers is embedded into the sculpture um, and, and into the trophy, which is now uh, coveted and has in fact become iconic in the logo and the branding of, of the World Surfing League. Here is the launch control tower at Cape Canaveral, uh, contemplated. Um, for SpaceX launches, obviously a very literal uh, gesture towards the catenary curve of a rocket, um, and uh, and then the control mechanisms of a launch pad itself. It's a five-story building with a rooftop with an observation deck. Uh, there was another earlier vision of a kind of floating saucer in the Everglades, um, and I hope these will. Yeah, the mandate from Elon was, I want something that is futuristic in the future. So I was trying to look at that challenge. So adjacent to the wing house, uh, the site was uh, uh, originally that of Tony Duquette, the only American to have a solo show at the Louvre, a decorative artist, and uh, an amazing appropriator of found objects. Uh, well, my wife, Laura, and I, we're lucky enough, um, after selling Californication House, to acquire the rest of the Tony Duquette estate adjacent to the wing house. Uh, it was featured recently in the Apple TV. Um, but my, my wife, uh, Laura, and I, have, you know, she's been an amazing collaborator. And what we've been trying to do is create a ecological restoration to build an ecosystem all out of native that's also fire resilient to build a, re a regenerative agriculture system that's full loop, that uses some of the biomass gasification, the biochar into soil, worm casting, um, atmospheric water generation, um, and soil rebuilding to sequester carbon. So these are some of the structures that I've been restoring uh, that Tony Duquette built. This we call the Triple Pagoda. It's made from satellite dishes, wire spools, 55-gallon drums, five-gallon paint cans, one-gallon paint cans, and lampshades. And that, that is the mastery of somebody through their frugality, efficiency, and creativity, like Tony Duquette for the movies. Um, and what would happen, of course, in Hollywood, nobody really traveled. Whenever they would see something, uh, they would go on a trip around the world, and they would pick up sets, whether they're from Java, these are made largely from the sets of The King and I, repurposed. Uh, we've done some interesting uh, parties there, utilizing light and creating space, creating 
utilizing natural, the, the natural beauty there uh, for a backdrop. In fact, here's my Aunt Merle with one of her Delahays uh, as a backdrop for a recent ad. We've also uh, utilized temporary structures in creative ways to, um, to uh, do some interesting work with, with people, especially with SEAL Team 6 and Delta Force Rangers uh, most recently. House in Venice called Hollywood Bowl House because it's made from the uh, old seats of the Hollywood Bowl. So um, those in, all have numbers and, and on the provenance from the Hollywood Bowl, uh, old cedar benches is also with Yato Suzuki. Um, and as we kind of get to wrap here, I've got a house I recently finished um, uh, that is on the island of Beckway, and you'll, th this was an incredible house. I think in a perfect world, architecture allows you to work with amazing cl clients that give you the latitude and involve travel and other experiences. This was a Phoenici, a traditional Indonesian vessel that we uh, chartered uh, and then found a pier in Borneo, out of, abandoned out of old ironwood, uh, designed the house out of extruded aluminum sections. So this island is very remote. Uh, it's in uh, near by Grenada. Uh, my wife Laura and I sailed from Grenada to meet my clients who sailed down from Beckway for the first time. We met um, in, on boats. And um, uh, everything that is coming to this island is coming on a boat. So the embodied energy is there. How do you do that efficiently? Aluminum, recycled uh, aluminum extrusions. Uh, there's no way to not make it square. They go together with one tool as a kind of flat pack arrangement. There were 15 containers and very little empty airspace in them. They are then clad with the reclaimed lumber so that they still retain a wooden feel, um, but a hollow aluminum uh, section for uh, mechanical systems. The entire building was built in Java um, and completely assembled, and we went with the clients. Every light switch, plumbing fixture, and finish completely assembled, disassembled, barcoded, shipped, and reassembled. Um, the Javanese craftsmanship was amazing. Um, the ability to use natural materials like woven palm and coconut, um, and we then also in video probably be easier to show some steel frames, the aluminum structure, uh, the entire building then therefore is resistant to termites, to mold. Um, it then has a large roof area which is needed in the Caribbean with a low uh, sun. Uh, for large, large overhangs. The roof took up very little space. It was unfurled, much like a sailing. These large masts were custom extruded out of aluminum. The then uh, uh, sails were draped over them, and Javanese workers worked alongside uh, uh, Caribbean workers, uh, German engineers, uh, British clients in a truly international uh, project. Eric Lindemann, who's here tonight, who we've been working together for about 20 years, the project architect on this. We work with Toma House in Bali, um, Stefan Schilly and, and Frank Toma. It was an amazingly collaborative uh, and cooperative effort. The way that the uh, roofs work, there's no water on this site and there's no energy on this site. So the roofs collect 100% of the water. Uh, they funnel them into the corners at the mast and then the water is brought into the foundation, which is a big hollow concrete box filled with hundreds of thousands of gallons of water. But they get tremendous amounts of water in short periods of time and then no water for long periods of time. The long uh, overhangs were created by this tensile membrane, and um, the reclaimed wood sits on top of that, uh, and we use that to make louvers. So the house is basically all completely open. There's no mechanical systems. 
it's all naturally ventilated but can be closed up with louvers. The louvers are then directed uh, for airflow for natural ventilation. And similarly, it's best seen in the context of a drone. Uh, it integrates quite nicely into the in landscape, uh, a large ironwood pivot door, the series of buildings have guest houses. It's somewhat like a bed and breakfast. Um, it looks out over the island chain. There's a large pool that um, is, again, 100% collected rainwater. And um, the views and capturing the prevailing breezes uh, make, it, make it very uh, habitable. A project uh, under uh, just in construction documents now in Venice is a um, hotel on an old railroad right away on Abbot Kinney, and it seeks to really open the restaurants to a large public courtyard uh, and tries to break up the mass of the buildings into a series of buildings with courtyards and bridges. Um, just finishing the NRDC uh, office, it was the first lead platinum building in Santa Monica. And now it's being positioned as a living building challenge, 100% net zero energy. We have a floating solar canopy roof. Worked on this project with Ed Milan in my office. Um, and I'm currently working on an aquarium for the Santa Monica Pier that uses these um, kind of marine-inspired uh, forms. Um, so what if buildings could give back? What if they can give back more than they could take? And when it comes to solar energy, we can convert daylight to electricity. We can grow food. But with California being acutely aware of foreign water, um, how do we deal with it? We could, there's limits to our efficiency. We can capture it. We don't even know what predictive weather patterns there are. The past is no longer prologue with respect to predicting weather. Um, so. Uh, I started playing with atmospheric water generation on the rooftop of my office in, on, on Market Street, hired an artist and put in a bottle filling station. And my, my wife, Laura, and I uh, started giving water away for free to the community during the middle of the drought. And the idea is why should the commons, water, be privatized and sold to us by corporations in plastic bottles where there's more plastic than plankton in the oceans? Why it, shouldn't water be free? Um, and so it's about the democratization of water. Interestingly, at around that time, the X Prize, which was uh, in part funded by Elon Musk and Pierre Diamandis, that's what got Lindbergh across the Atlantic. It's an incentive prize. How can we take nascent technologies that have not emerged yet um, and make a, an audacious but achievable challenge? So the challenge was a global challenge of how can we address water scarcity by making 2,000 liters of, of water in 24 hours at a cost of less than two cents, and it had to be 100% renewable energy. So it's interesting because I forgot about some of the earlier diagrams on the island, but I, the, the energy system was using biomass gasification. That is, all plants take in volatiles like methane, hydrogen, and if you heat them up, you can liberate those volatiles into a gas, and you could make incredible energy at a tenth of the area and cost of any renewable energy, and it's not intermittent. It's a continuous source as long as you have biomass. Well, biomass is the most abundant fuel source that we have on this planet. So we use a process called pyrolysis to, to not only create the energy out of the biomass, but also extract the moisture out of the biomass into a cyclical system that is a virtuous cycle with a cascade of benefits that is now mimicking nature because we're sequestering the atmospheric carbon that would have been released by that biomass into a solid called biochar. That biochar locks up that carbon in an inert state for thousands of years and used in soil environment creates nitrogen fixing. It harbors moisture. It is beneficial bacteria. So we started to really look at this, ended up building a, a machine to do this 72-hour test in Berkeley, California, worked with some Stanford dropouts, famous for 
burning down his dormitory, exploring with pyrolysis, uh, Jim Mason uh, here and his All Power Labs in Berkeley, a kind of a renegade group of visionaries uh, from Burning Man. Um, we had very little time. Um, we didn't have time to raise money. We were actually excluded from the competition in the late phases, only to be entered back into the race with no equalization. And so rather than coming at it from behind, we thought, well, now we have a stealth advantage. Uh, but to do this, uh, we took out a $1.5 million loan on our house to, to fund this. And thank God we won or else. We, so Willem Swart, uh, who I think also is here tonight, um, had just kind of entered the office and, um, and had a trial by fire to learn how to sleep uh, in, in a chair uh, while, while working on the 72 hours. So it was a huge uh, test of the technology of the idea. We won a number of awards, but it's not about the awards. It's about how are we going to address one of the fundamental crises on our planet, which is water scarcity. By, by 2030, 40% uh, uh, the water's gonna, uh, demand's gonna outstrip supply by 40%. This is a massive problem. This is gonna be a force multiplier that forces migration, warfare, and other things. I mean, there, what, besides air, what other hierarchy of needs is there besides water? So this, this is um, a passion project. Now, of the drinking water on the planet, less than 1% of it is fresh. It's almost all salt water. The rest is locked up in ice, which is quickly becoming salt water. However, six times more water in the atmosphere exists at any given time than all the rivers combined on the planet in vapor. You see it, those are clouds, that's fog, but there's also water vapor that you don't see. So Laura and I formed this company called SkySource to leverage the technology that we use in winning the X Prize to make the we do which stands for Wood to Energy Deployable Emergency Water. It uses these iconography uh, symbols of al al alchemical symbols of earth, fire, and air to make water. They're in ruggedized, disused shipping containers that are easily, easily transportable and, um, and has a series of different um, multimodal functions to them, uh, a full suite of interchangeable and integrated kit of parts. So not only water, but high density electricity, battery charging, cooling, communications, and global learning. So we see these as community resilience hubs, especially in the developing world. We exist within large cycles, um, hydrologic cycle, the carbon cycle, and the photosynthetic cycle. And there can be a cascade of benefits coming out and other uses of biochar, including graphene and other amazing nanomaterials. So don't have time to go into the whole mechanisms, but it's basically using what nature does best through these simple laws of thermodynamics that are non-negotiable to make potable water, to address biomass problems like fire prevention, to plug into microgrids, to be off the grid, or to regenerative agriculture. Uh, small, not big, dispersed, not centralized, to scale up, scale down, uh, and to swarm uh, when needed. Uh, the hope is to create point of use solutions for localized opportunities uh, for uh, especially women-owned uh, collaboratives that normally would be walking for water and now could make water. Um, it operates in its steady state of self-reliance, but is part of a larger climate adaptive and climate resilient practice, and then can swarm rapidly for emergency response. This is an example of the anti-fragility because of course, if you have a hurricane, you have a, an abundance of wet biomass and you need energy and water. It, I chose tonight a uh, topic, and for, fortunately it coincides with the Woolsey fire that occurred five years ago uh, today, and we're in red flag conditions as we left. Uh, our property is on the 
western edge of the Santa Monica Mountains. Uh, the area there in the uh, square uh, where it's b burned around 260 degrees in the middle of that is our property or is our property. Um, and we learned about resilience and the definition really of resilience is the ability to restore a previously healthy state after trauma. The capacity to adapt to misfortune or change, the capacity and capability of a strained body to recover its size and shape after deformation caused by especially stress, and the ability to maintain stability. So what are these phases? There are phases to uh, resilience. Um, and we think about this in the context of our own life. You should think about this in the context of what you're doing as students now, because you're in a growth phase. You're putting tremendous amounts of time and hard work and talent and energy into the growth phase of your careers. At some point, there is a natural order to things, and there's a desire to hold on to that phase through a conservation phase. And there are transitions in between. At some point, all things are moving to entropy, and we're all passing through, and all systems are passing through. And there will be a release phase. And finally, there will be a reorganization phase. So understanding resilience is to understand the transitions and the thresholds between these phases and to be anticipatory. Because if you can see, if your Kodak that, you know, that digital is coming, you can pivot and retool before you're caught too late. Understanding how much disturbance a system can take before reaching a threshold is critical, and the failure to identify the threshold leads to entropy. So architects, of course, have been responding to disasters for decades and are frequent collaborators in identifying, compiling, and sharing lessons learned to in integrate mitigation and adaptation measures and reduce vulnerability. So we need to design, I suggest, with resilience in mind, because resilience is upon us. We never really achieve sustainability, and now we have to respond. These are just some of the tenets of resilience that can be applied towards design. So how do we design for resilience? These are some of the catalytic cap capacity to build resilience, decoupling, density, diversity, simplicity, dynamic reorganization, built-in counteracting mechanisms, tight feedback loops, swarming, clustering, and modularity. Redundancy is nature's risk management. It's self-organizing, adaptable. Oh, I got off my slide here. Self-replicating and self-healing. So the triad really is a fragile state, a robust state, and an anti Fragile state. A fragile state wants tranquility. A robust doesn't care that much about stressors. And anti-fragility grows from disorder. So this robust and resilient differs from anti-fragility in that they don't benefit from randomness and chaos. But anti-fragility does. Randomness, nonlinear systems, asymmetry of risk, benefits from stressors and disorder, predictive systems, fractal self-similarity, anticipatory transformation, achieving strength under harm are all of the tenets. So adaptive capacity is our, relates to system's ability to respond to a stress trigger versus a transformative capacity, means acting proactively with the support of a system perspective to contribute to the development of new sustainable practices, logics, and technologies. So this is not really a kumbaya moment. I mean, this is a moment of, of urgency. Um, and what we're also doing is we have within our firm a resilience lab that generates new emerging technologies. Uh, we also have a fund that invests in emerging technologies and climate tech. Uh, we're employing our transformative capacity to advance emergent methods, technologies, materials, and systems in climate technology, in water, food, energy, and carbon drawdown sectors that are set for exponential growth, that are disruptive, and can scale to address the problem for beneficial uh, access. And ultimately, a resilience foundation, a nonprofit, 
which helps to implement these, especially in, in communities. Uh, wrapping up here, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was invited to participate at the White House Summit on Building Resilient Communities and the release of the President's Resiliency Framework. And it was very, very encouraged that this is very much the tenant uh, of, of, of the future and how we're going to respond. Um, in closing, we have a choice to solve the gravest challenge facing our, our planet and our species. Uh, every problem is a possibility in disguise. Uh, because the world's greatest problems produce some of the world's greatest opportunities, I encourage you to design with resilience in mind like our lives depend on it, because they just might. Thank you.